of the rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, upholding my responsibilities as a member of this legislative body. I am communicating to you that I have been requested to testify before the Fulton County, Georgia Special Purpose Grand Jury on July 19, 2022. Additionally, pursuant to 28 United States Code 1442A1, I will be asking for removal to the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. Nothing in this notice should be construed to deprive, condition, or waive the constitutional or legal privileges or rights applicable or available at any time to a member. See paragraph 4 of Rule 8 of the Rules of the U.S. House of Representatives. Signed sincerely, Jody Heiss, Member of Congress. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for the purpose of inquiring to the House Majority Whip the schedule for next week. Without objection. Also, uh, Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you. With that, I am happy to yield to my friend, the gentleman from South Carolina, the Majority Whip of the House, Mr. Clyburn. Thank you very much, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. On Monday, uh, the House will meet at 12 p.m. for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business, with votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Next week, the House will begin our work to advance appropriations bills to fund the government for fiscal year 2023 and consider H.R. 8294, a minibus package of transportation, housing and urban development, agriculture, rural development, energy and water development, financial services, and general government, interior, environment, military construction, and veterans affairs. The House will also consider Representative Kathy Manning's H.R. 8373, the Right to Contraception Act, which will protect in federal statute the rights enshrined in Griswold v. Connecticut and in Assenstadt v. Bayer. American women deserve to be able to make decisions about their own bodies and their own lives, including whether to become pregnant and have children. The House will consider bills on the suspension of the rules. The House, the complete list of suspension bills will be announced by the close of business today. Additional legislative matters are possible. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding on those. And uh, I know this is a conversation I've had for months with the majority leader uh, as we've talked about the concern over high gas prices. And I noticed that on the agenda that was listed, there are no bills that would deal with the high price of gasoline that families are struggling under due to President Biden's many different actions he's taken to shut down American energy. Of course, as we know, the president today is in Saudi Arabia begging the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to produce more oil when we've been asking the president to work with us to open up American energy, which is abundant, available, unfortunately closed for business. And of course, we know during the campaign President Biden bragged that he was going to shut down drilling. He was going to make it hard for the energy companies to produce in America, and he's done that. The problem is it's had devastating impacts on families. And so we brought forward a number of bills. Again, months ago, I've presented some of these to the majority leader. He said he would look at them and consider bringing some of them up. And I want to just present a few of these to the gentleman from South Carolina to see if we can get consideration of some of these bills next week at a time when we just saw a report with 9.1% inflation, worst numbers in 40 years, uh, in large part driven 
by the high price of gasoline. We've got bills to alleviate that problem that families are facing. And I'll start with H.R. 7285 by Mr. Carl. This is the Unleashing American Energy Act. It requires the Secretary of Interior to conduct a minimum number of oil and gas lease sales so that we can get back to producing more energy here. H.R. 7292 by Garrett Graves. This is the Securing American Energy and Investing in Resiliency Act requires the Secretary of Interior to conduct all oil and gas lease sales that under current law he's supposed to be doing, but the President's not in compliance with existing law on that. H.R. 7293, the Energy Permitting Certainty Act by Ms. Harrell. This requires the Secretary of Interior to process applications for a permit to drill. Doesn't tell the Secretary what determination they have to give, but it gives them a shot clock, just like they give to businesses. When they tell the business, you have to give us an answer on something, it's by a certain date. Yet when the permits are submitted, the applications are submitted, the agency just ignores it, just doesn't do their job. Let's get an answer. Yes or no, let's get an answer and back it up with facts. That's what this bill requires. H.R. 7298, which is the Promoting Energy Independence and Transparency Act by Mr. Moore from Utah. This requires the Secretary of Interior to submit a report on expressions of interest and applications for permits to drill and requires the publication of data on expressions of interest and applications on permits to drill. H.R. 7304, the Restore Onshore Energy Production Act by Mr. Rosendale. This requires the Secretary of Interior to immediately resume onshore oil and gas lease sales. Let us have an opportunity to utilize our natural resources to lower the price of gas. H.R. 751, Protecting American Energy Production Act by Mr. Duncan. This prohibits any declaration of a moratorium on the use of hydraulic fracturing, which again has been a threat by this administration on a very efficient, clean source of energy that America could produce, but right now is being dramatically limited. And finally, H.R. 1616, promoting Interagency Coordination for Review of Natural Gas Pipelines Act by Dr. Burgess. This provides for federal and state agency coordination in the approval of certain authorizations under the Natural Gas Act for the critical infrastructure of pipelines to move energy throughout America so we don't have to get it from tankers from foreign con countries, many of them hostile to America. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to yield to see if we could get some consideration next week of some of those bills, if not all. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. And I assure you that um, we will uh, get to uh, discuss and debate and hopefully uh, pass all of these bills at the appropriate time. However, I'm sure the gentleman is aware uh, that Russia's war against Ukraine is driving up prices all over the world. Uh, Putin's price hike. Three weeks ago, the price of crude oil was trading at $115.25 per barrel. It closed yesterday at $96.47 a barrel, a decrease of $18.78 per barrel, or a decrease of 16% in almost a month. The average price for gasoline, uh, last, a gallon of gas last month, was $5.01. It's now $4.57, a decrease of 44 cents, or a decrease of 8% in a month. Funny how that works. Cuts at the pump, or half that of the price of crude. And we are shocked to know that major oil companies are raking in record profits. The House passed uh, the Lower Cost Food and Fuel Cost Act, which will help ease inflation, which the gentleman voted against and quipped against. This bill helps Americans save money at the gas pump by promoting local renewable energy production. And it also expands access to E15. The House also passed the Consumer Fuel Price Gouging Prevention Act, 
to prevent all corporations from prioritizing profits instead of increasing supply. Empowers the FTC to crack down on all companies that excessively overcharge their consumers for gas just to boost their bottom line. The president has released historic amounts uh, from our strategic uh, petroleum reserve, a million gallons a day, and expanded access to triple, uh, cheaper E15 gas across the Midwest, among other steps uh, to bring down energy prices. The Biden administration has approved more drilling permits on public lands in 2021 than the previous administration did each year during the first three years in office, 2017, 2018, and 2019. The Biden administration is also working with our allies and partners around the world to implement a price cap on Russian oil so that we can continue to inflict pain on Putin while minimizing the pain at the pump. I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. If, if the gentleman's interested in inflicting pain on Putin, then pass these bills. These bills will take away all of Putin's leverage. The only reason Vladimir Putin has any leverage over America and Europe is because President Biden shut down American energy. And again, each of these bills addresses different components of President Biden's attack on American energy. It's been a very direct assault on American energy on many different fronts. These lay out all of those things. You can have all the leases in the world, but if the administration won't give permits to actually execute the lease, to go do seismic, to go build pipelines so you can actually move the resource, to drill in new areas while the resource is being depleted in other areas, then you don't have an ability to secure America's future. And it results in the president going hat in hand to foreign countries like Saudi Arabia. And I'd just point out, I know the president likes talking about carbon emissions a lot. It's a 5,700 mile trek to Saudi Arabia and I would imagine he's gonna come back home. That's more than 11,000 miles on Air Force One. And if you notice the picture, there are no solar panels on the wings of Air Force One. It's jet fuel that actually gets it from here to there and back with the president and his staff. You could save all 11,000 miles in the entire carbon footprint of that trip by staying here in America, and I would recommend going to a place like Port Fouchon in South Louisiana, where they produce energy cleaner, cheaper, and with American jobs. And by the way, as states drill, they get revenue sharing. Uh, they would actually be able to use that investment to lower prices at the pump and to help American families. And so if you think about where the price is today, whether it's $5.20, $4.80. Of course, it continues to go back and forth in a very high range. It's all double, more than double what it was two years ago. And what that means is people that are filling up, they're looking at the bottom line. They're looking at the fact that it's costing them over $150 to fill their car today when it cost them maybe $70 two years ago if they can afford to fill it up all the way. We're seeing a trend right now where many families can't even get it to full. They might have to only go halfway because they can't afford the full price. Their credit cards get maxed out before then because if they're filling up to go to the grocery store, they're also paying double-digit increases for everything they're buying there because of the spending-induced inflation. And so I would suggest if we want to send a message to Putin, no better way to do it than to cut him off at the knees in his ability to hold leverage over America and Europe by producing more here in America. We produce it in America. Cartels can't control the price. Putin can't control the price. We can meet all of our needs and help our allies around the world so that Putin has no leverage over anybody. The only person giving Putin leverage today is President Biden by allowing all these limitations on American energy production that these bills will remove. These bills will help America get back to energy independence by unleashing all of those different leverages, those different inhibitions, the prohibitions that President Biden's put on our energy. And again, if he was against all fossil fuels, maybe there would be a consistency in policy, but 
He's only against American fossil fuels. He will travel 5,700 miles to beg Saudi to produce oil that he won't allow our own producers here in America to produce. I think that's what's got Americans irate the most, and I would yield. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for the yield. And I think the gentleman is well aware that um, uh, the president uh, has certain uh, authorities that he can use, and he's using them. Uh, the oil yeah. companies uh, have certain responsibilities. And the question is whether or not uh, they are living up uh, to their responsibilities. I know the gentleman is as aware as I am of all the permits out there uh, that are not being utilized. Uh, and, of course, we are at the mercy of those corporate decisions, and hopefully they'll be made uh, in due course and in such a way uh, that would bring relief to the American people. Uh, I suspect the consideration of all those uh, bills that you are discussing uh, will be taken up by the leader uh, at the time that he considers to be appropriate. Uh, and I, uh, along with the gentleman, uh, will continue to consult with him. And hopefully, we can uh, address all these issues uh, in the very, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, shortly. With that, are you back? I appreciate that. And hopefully, uh, as I continue to have these conversations with the leader, maybe you and I could be whipping these bills together and you'd see an overwhelming result and a quick reduction in the price at the pump that are hurting families. Uh, one final question I want to raise to the gentleman, and this came up yesterday as we were having, or two days ago as we were having a series of votes on the National Defense Authorization Act. As the gentleman pointed out, next week we will be bringing up some of the appropriations bills, still more to come over the next few weeks. As we have large numbers of amendments on bills like NDAA and appropriations, which is typical for the process, to be able to go back to two-minute voting where we can do our business not in four hours until 11 o'clock at night, but where we can actually be more efficient at processing all of the requests that members have to get a vote on different issues, we have continued to push to end proxy voting. And again, you've seen most of the country already get there. Most of the country is getting back to work. Airplanes, finally, you don't have to wear masks anymore. People are traveling internationally again. People are opening up their offices again to get workers in the office. Congress, frankly, should be leading, not lagging on this. But if we got rid of proxy voting, we could get back next week to two-minute votes and be much more effective and efficient in doing our jobs here in Congress. Is that something that the majority would consider, especially looking at six different appropriations bills, which I'm sure will yield hundreds of amendments that would be debated and voted on on this floor? And I'd yield. Thank you for yielding. As the gentleman knows, the proxy voting has been utilized by both sides of the aisle. I admit uh, it can be a very a uh, cumbersome um, process here on the floor, uh, but we all utilize it. Uh, and it's done so uh, because uh, it serves a very, very uh, valuable uh, purpose for this institution. We have made great strides in mitigating the harm of the coronavirus pandemic uh, through vaccines and treatments, but as we both know, the disease continues to spread uh, in both our home states. Uh, we are hearing numbers uh, that are very, very uh, concerning. In just this week of this session alone, I know of several members uh, who have tested positive uh, for COVID and are therefore isolating. These members uh, can still uh, participate in the process and uh, represent their constituents uh, by uh, using the proxy vote. And of course, uh, having the proxy vote and having two minute <laughs> votes uh, doesn't seem uh, a pretty efficient process to me. Uh, we're having a hard time getting it done doing five minutes. Uh, we just had several five minute votes, and I saw on uh, my friend's side of the aisle, uh, about 15 people still lined up uh, after the time uh, has expired. So uh, both of us uh, are being um, uh, disadvantaged, uh, inconvenient uh, by this process, 
but I think it's something that we have to do. I uh, don't know how uh, we could uh, be efficient with this operation with too many voting. Um, I suspect I'll pass that along to the leader and hope that he will uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, coronavirus is still here with us. As the gentleman knows, uh, we served together on the coronavirus uh, select subcommittee, uh, and we are confronted uh, with issues that still concern the American people, uh, and I think uh, that we have to keep all of that in mind as we try to carry out uh, the people's business. I'll you back. I appreciate that, and uh, I, I would share, and if the gentleman wanted to share as well with the majority leader, our side stands ready and strongly encourages the complete elimination of proxy voting. We could absolutely get back to two-minute voting with that, and it's not a partisan issue. You can look across the aisle in the United States Senate. They've never utilized proxy voting. Uh, they continue to do their work. It's, of course, controlled by the Democrats over there. They represent the same states that we represent. They managed to do their business without proxy voting so that everybody has to show up to do their job. This time, no different than any other time in our nation's history. There are some people that get ill. There are some people that have surgeries. There are some people that just have other things maybe with their family that take them away. Uh, and that's something that we all accommodate, we all recognize as a as a condition of doing a job that actually requires interaction with other people, but the Senate's managed to do it without proxy voting. We just would urge that the House embrace that same approach. So we'll continue to push for that, uh, allow us to do things like two-minute voting. But unless the gentleman has anything else, I'm prepared to yield back. I'll yield back. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you.